So we talk about um, congenital heart disease today, and congenital heart disease has come out of the shadows. You have seen, you will see a patient with congenital heart disease. I mean, one in 150 young people um, are predicted to have congenital heart disease in the UK. And, and of course, it is a large number. So if you look for an interesting and safe job as a cardiologist, we need more congenital cardiologists. And of course, inactivity in this population is a particularly big problem for, for a couple of reasons. Um, we know, though, that activity and, and, and exercise um, um, capacity are reduced in, in this patient population. We also know that training is actually safe. But here it comes. There's an overprotection from carers, from, from, from um, um, organizations, but also from us cardiologists. And I think we need to, uh, we need to um, address this because all these people will have also the common risk factors for cardiovascular disease when they're older. And I think we need to improve um, exercise involvement of patients, children, and adults with congenital heart disease. And these are the facts. Only 10% of adults um, receive any rehabilitation programs, and in children, it's, it's, it's less so. So why is that? Why is that? And it's certainly there because these patients are very, very difficult to deal with. There are a lot of lesions, it's very individual, and we do not have real guidelines to um, um, tell these patients what exercise to do. So if you look at this, I don't know if you can see it, but these are the, this is the exercise, this is the exercise um, capacities. Here's the diagnosis, here's the VO2. You probably be in the 30s, 40s, I hope somewhere here, some even in the 50s. And the main point of this slide is, Firstly, exercise capacity is reduced. But the other thing is, this is snow shoveling. So that's how much energy you expend in snow shoveling. Look at many of these diagnoses, they would go to the view to max. So if we train them, it's not only to beat their friends and feel good about it, it's really to have a good, active daily life. Yeah? So that's very important. And of course, we also know from studies that if you improve your exercise function, for example, view to or your heart rate reserve, your hazard ratio for mortality goes down. And this is also shown here. These are subgroups that doesn't matter, but you can see the fitter you are, be it VO2, be it heart rate, the fitter you are, the better your survival rate is. And that's huge because the mortality is quite high in this population. So someone comes to you and says, yes, I want to do this, and I want to do even more. What um, recommendations do we have? Well, we have these from 2015, and they are very, very useful, and I will not... Um, um, criticize him too much, but there are certain problems on it in these recommendations, um, and I show you what they are. Firstly, they are based on the Mitchell classification of sport. You all know this, and it has been used, it has been a good concept, but it's got clearly limitations because you can do sports in this category and really, really push particular in training in terms of endurance. So that's not very helpful, particularly in congenital heart disease where you've got a, a, a multitude of problems. So. First thing of these recommendations we're going to put out, and, and Sanjay mentioned it, but I have not put the paper or the authors on because I'm superstitious. It's under review, so I will not show it yet. But I want to invite you to look at um, exercise recommendations a little bit differently. First thing is the um, classification of sports. This is a paper by, um, um, led by Antonio Pelliccia. Many of the authors sit in the audience, which I think has a much more intelligent approach to which sports um, um, we uh, categorize in which, um, in which section. And this is because it looks much more what are the effects of the certain discipline of the certain type of sport on your cardiovascular system. Yeah. And that goes away from purely high endurance versus isometric exercise. Of course, you can even here argue, I used to be a fairly competitive high-performance stinky sailor, and, and jumping from one trapeze to the other is certainly not only skill, that is really, really a lot of... Uh, um, required a lot of strength and endurance. However, you can see here these various uh, categories and it helps you much better to put all the different sports into um, the category, how do they affect my cardiovascular system? Why is this important for congenital heart disease? I will tell you this on the next slide, but first I want to give you this slide. So this is a uh, recommendation from 2015 I, I um, um, introduced two slides ago. So. Two things. One thing is, if you've got a follower, let's look at tetralogy of follows. You all know this. Yeah? So if I've got a follows patient who's got normal function, no arrhythmias, is super fit, has no problems at all, you can let them exercise. Well, thank you very much, of course. Um, yeah, that is easy. If you've got someone who's got a ejective function below 40 and has got also arrhythmia risk and exercise tolerance is not good, he shouldn't exercise. Well, the interesting thing is that, of course, most of my patients lie here in the middle. So these recommendations do not really help me because um, they are somewhere, they have some dysfunction or some arrhythmia risk. And even more so, and this is very important, um, 
if you can let the videos play, this is an exercise echocardiogram that doesn't matter, but these are two athletes with Tetralogy of Fallows. They're almost twins. They've got the same exercise capacity, same 24-hour tape. MRI is a bit different. Left one is more dilated. And look at this exercise echocardiogram. I'm sure you can see that this right ventricle is falling apart during exercise. This right ventricle is coping. You've got dilatation here, and the function is clearly reduced. They're both elite tennis players, football players on the American um, pro circuit, and this is a county-level football player. So what do I do with these people? The previous recommendations don't really help me because I've got even intradiagnostic interpatient variability. So um, what um, we can do then is, let's think like a congenital cardiologist who assesses these people. What do I do when I sit in the consultation room and have all the tests available to me and come to a decision? The one thing I need to know, what is the risk? You can read it here. The risk is, of course, higher than in a normal population for patients with congenital heart disease. But the, the, the sudden cardiac um, um, death or arrest during exercise is actually not very high. But what are the points that are very important in congenital heart disease? Of course, it's complexity of disease. And this has been incorporated in the 2015 guidelines. But it's also ventricular dysfunction, history of arrhythmias, palmy hypertension, degree of cyanosis, and the presence of aortic disease. We've heard about it. And of course, a lack of physical tearing or VO2. This is what I do in two minutes in my clinic and then make a decision. So, and we said, can we not put it into a document that addresses all this? And this has been done. This is a wonderful paper. And again, some of the um, speakers here have been in the audience. And this is not for competitive sport, but it's for adults with congenital heart disease, how to advise them on exercise. And this makes a really individualized approach and I want to go through it with you, and we hope this can address the, the difficulties we have with patients who have a different diagnosis and within the diagnosis have actually different exercise capacity. So first thing is, of course, I mean, that's, you do this every day, history and physical examination. Very important um, in, in congenital heart disease. And then you assess five baseline parameters, which I will uh, show you in a second. Uh -huh. The next thing is you include in your assessment CPAT always. Um, I don't, I don't think someone with congenital heart disease should do sports without having been assessed during exercise. Very important and regularly. And then, of course, you can come to a conclusion and recommend the type of exercise. And very important follow-up. We see our athletes with congenital heart disease if they're competitive every half a year and at least every year. Yeah. And this then can inform you. So, so this is an approach that really does not, does not, is not based on diagnosis. Because it doesn't matter if you've got Fallow or if you've got Epstein's. It, it really depends on your individual pathophysiology. So what are the five things, the big five, you look at? And that's very important. Of course, one, it is um, ventricular function. The other thing is you look at the aorta, because there's a lot of associated aortic pathology. Of course, you need to look at the arrhythmia risk, which is very important. During rest, uh, at rest and during exercise. And of course, you also uh, need to look at the oxygen saturations. Yeah? And here we say everything below 95% uh, is, is abnormal. And permeable tension, you can do it by echo, 2.8 meters per second, following to the guidelines is abnormal. I will not present all the normative data. And you assess all these, and then you can very easily go into the categories. Where we have really struggled is when it comes to hypertrophy and a bit of pressure loading. Because we will have, of course, athletes who've got hypertrophic hearts, who've got dilated hearts, and maybe also higher pressure. So this, we have got uh, special values which are a bit more lenient than the previous, um, um, previous recommendation. You go through these, and I think then, in the end, you can go back to this scheme, and you go do this for an ind individual uh, patient, and you base your exercise recommendation for competitive sport or also for, um, for leisure sport on these recommendations. So we hope this will um, um, remove some uncertainty as to what to do with the individual patient. And that it is needed is clear. My, my, my mentor and senior colleague, Greg Stewart, Stewart, and I in Bristol, we get a lot of um, calls and a lot of um, 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 requests to assess these athletes. And that just means there's not information out there. So in summary, hopefully these recommendations will come out and hopefully they can make it easier as a tool to assess um, patients with congenital heart disease because it is important um, we assess them um, because it is a very, very common disease. And, and I think we've got also a duty to let these people be part in sports and exercise, particularly for young people. Of course, when you assess them, um, you know, you need to um, uh, know that exercise is an outcome predictor. That's why we assess them during exercise. Of course, the new recommendation, they are they move towards really a bit of precision medicine. I don't want to 
over quality here, but it is an individualized medicine we can do and we have to do in this patient population because as I showed you, same diagnosis can be very different pathology, so going by diagnosis is not very good. Individual assessment is key. Exercise assessment is a must in congenital heart disease um, because a lot of the pathology, like the echocardiograms I showed to you, are only um, um, detected during exercise. And then regular longitudinal assessment is essential because things can change very quickly, particularly in operated patients who've got a conduit in, who've got pressure overload, who've got leaky valves. And another, another very important message is also, if you assess elite athletes with congenital heart disease, don't be fooled by a very good exercise tolerance. Of course, they are super fit because they're athletes, but often this can mask actually an underlying pathology. And we might even nowadays, we move, we move actually to the point to intervene earlier in athletes, it's a bit controversial, and I have problems to tell this my surgeons, that you want to keep the exercise performance high and normal, so you might actually intervene a little bit earlier. And yeah. That's, I think, all I would like to say. Apart from that sports cardiology and congenital cardiology, we need to work better together. Otherwise, I think, as I said, we don't do right to our small population, but increasing population of athletes with congenital heart disease. Thanks very much.